Hey there, all you space fans out there. Yeah. It's time for another deep dive with us. And today, we're going to be talking about the race back to the moon. Ooh. It's getting pretty interesting, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's hotting up for sure. We've got NASA and their Artemis program. Right. Uh, you know, they've hit a bit of a snag with Artemis the second, another delay. And then you've got SpaceX just rocketing ahead with Starship. It's crazy how different their approaches seem to be. Mm. So by the end of this deep dive, you'll not only understand why Artemis II is delayed again, but also what it tells us about the different ways we're now approaching space exploration. Mm. Isn't that right? Absolutely. It really is a fascinating time to be following all this. We're seeing this real clash of styles in spaceflight, almost like a generational shift. Yeah, totally. So let's get right into it with this Artemis II situation. Mm -hmm. This mission was originally supposed to send astronauts around the moon in September 2025. Right. But now it's been pushed back to April 2026, mm -hmm. which means a moon landing won't happen until at least 2027. What's going on? Why the delay? Well, it basically comes down to one crucial piece of tech, the heat shield on the Orion capsule. Mm -hmm. During Artemis, I, you know, that uncrewed test flight, right. the heat shield got more damage than they expected. Really? Yeah, there was a lot of charring, erosion, even some cracks. And, of course, the heat shield is what keeps the astronauts from burning up on reentry. Right, of course. So NASA is being super cautious about it. Understandably, 1,400 degrees Celsius is no joke. Oh, definitely not. So this really underlines how hard atmospheric reentry is and why getting that heat shield right is absolutely critical. It makes you wonder how SpaceX is doing it. They seem to be reusing Starship without many problems with the heat shield. Yeah, they do, don't they? It's pretty impressive. SpaceX has really been pushing the boundaries with their reusable Starship. And a big part of that is their heat shield tech. Those ceramic tiles they use are incredible. They can withstand those crazy re-entry temperatures without falling apart. It's so like some kind of super tough heat resistant armor for the it, spacecraft. It's kind of mind blowing mm -hmm. to think we can reuse a spacecraft like that. It changes everything. And I think I read somewhere that this is the first time ever that a heat shield designed for orbital reentry has been successfully reused. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's a huge achievement. So it's not just about saving money then, is it? What other impl implications does this reusability have? Well, you're right. It's about a whole new way of thinking about space travel. Up until now, rockets and capsules have been single use, Yeah. which makes space exploration ridiculously expensive. It really limits what we can do. It's like throwing away your car after every trip to the grocery store. <laughs> uh. Yeah, exactly. But with reusability, the cost per mission plummets. It opens up so many possibilities. Suddenly, space becomes more affordable for research, for commercial stuff, even space tourism. Imagine a future where going to space is as normal as flying across the Atlantic. It's incredible to think about, but it puts a lot of pressure on NASA, doesn't it? Hmm. I mean, their space launch system, the SLS, it's a traditional non-reusable rocket. It's been criticized for being expensive and slow to develop. Compared to SpaceX, it seems like they're stuck in the past. There's definitely a big difference in their approaches, and it's causing a lot of debate. Mm. The SLS has been in development for over a decade wow. and cost billions of dollars. SpaceX, on the other hand, has developed and tested their reusable Starship much faster and for a lot less money. It's like we're seeing a new space race. But this time, it's not just about national pride. Right. It's about completely different ideas about how to get to space, who gets to go, and what we do when we're there. Yeah. And then on top of that, you've got China entering the game. They're aiming for a crewed moon landing by 2030. It's well, turning into a real multiplayer space game. It certainly adds a whole new layer to things. Mm -hmm. And it raises some interesting questions about whether this new space race will be more collaborative or competitive. Will we see nations and private companies working together or will it be every man for himself? Mm. Yeah, it's a fascinating dynamic. Yeah, it really is a fascinating dynamic. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, there's this global attrition. Everyone wants to get to the moon and beyond. But then there's this tension, too, this sense that everyone's rushing to stake their claim out there. And then there's that whole thing about Jared Isaacman potentially becoming the head of NASA. That could really change everything, couldn't it? Oh, absolutely. Jared Isaacman, the billionaire who led that all-civilian Inspiration4 mission on SpaceX's Dragon capsule. Right. Well, apparently he's in the running to replace Bill Nelson. And if he does become the NASA administrator, yeah. it could mean a big change in direction for the agency. I mean, Isaacman is all about entrepreneurship. He really believes in commercial spaceflight. He does, doesn't he? And he's a big advocate for faster innovation, which is much more aligned with how SpaceX does things than with NASA's traditional ways. It's like we're seeing two completely different visions for the future of space exploration. The old school government-led approach yeah. and this new, faster, more commercially driven model. Mm-hmm. 
Can NASA even adapt to that? Or are they going to get left behind? That's the big question, isn't it? NASA has this amazing track record, but they're also this massive bureaucracy. Right. It's hard to change direction quickly, mm. you know? To really embrace a more agile, commercially driven approach would take a huge cultural shift. Mm. I'm not sure they're ready for that, or even if they can do it. Then there's the SLS. They've already spent billions on it. Yeah. Can they really justify putting more money into a non-reusable rocket when everyone else is moving towards reusability? It's a tough situation for them. They've invested so much in the SLS, but it already feels kind of outdated. It makes you wonder what's going to happen to the Artemis program. If Isaacman takes over, could they ditch the SLS and go for a more SpaceX-style approach? It's definitely possible. He's made it very clear that he admires what SpaceX has achieved uh -huh. and that he thinks the private sector is the key to innovation and efficiency. If he does end up leading NASA, I wouldn't be surprised to see them working a lot more closely with commercial companies and maybe even moving away from the SLS to something reusable. And we can't forget about China either. They're aiming for a crude moon landing by 2030. Right. And they've been making some serious progress. Yeah, China is definitely a force to be reckoned with in this new space race. Their space program is really impressive. They're clearly serious about becoming a major player. And that puts even more pressure on both NASA and SpaceX. It's almost like a three-way race now. Yeah. And each player has their own strengths and weaknesses. It feels like we're at a turning point in the history of space exploration. Mm -hmm. All these different players, all these different ways of doing things. It's exciting and a little bit scary Yeah, and definitely worth keeping an eye on. I agree. It's not just about who gets to the moon first. It's about shaping the future of humanity in space. You know, uh. will we cooperate and share our discoveries or will it be all about competition and national interests? The decisions we make now are going to have a huge impact on generations to come. OK, so we've covered a lot of ground here. NASA facing some hurdles, SpaceX charging ahead with their reusable rockets, and China steadily building up their space program. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to think about. Hmm. What are the main takeaways from our deep dive today? Well, I think the biggest one is that we're in the middle of a major shift in how we approach space exploration. The old way of doing things, you know, with governments running these huge expensive programs, yeah. that's being challenged by these private companies like SpaceX who are bringing a whole new level of innovation and speed to the game. And that's creating both good and bad things. Right. I mean, on the one hand, it's speeding things up, making space travel more accessible, opening up new possibilities. Right. But it also raises questions about how we're going to cooperate and compete in space. Exactly. With more players getting involved, we need to be smart about how we handle this new era of exploration. Are we going to work together and share what we find? Or is it just going to be a race for resources and power? And what about these private companies? What's their role? How do we make sure that space exploration benefits everyone, not just a few lucky people. Those are some really big questions, and there are no easy answers. But that's what makes this whole thing so interesting and important. The choices we make now are going to affect space exploration for generations to come. Yeah, and I think it's important to remember that this isn't just about technology or politics. It's about that human desire to explore, to push our limits and see what's out there. That's been with us since the beginning, and it's what's going to take us to the stars eventually. Well said. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to wrap up this deep dive into the new space race. We've talked about the technical challenges, the different ways people are approaching things and the political stuff that's going on. But the most important thing to remember is this. The future of space exploration isn't set in stone. It's being shaped right now. Mm. And it's up to all of us to decide what it's going to look like. So stay curious, stay informed, and keep looking up. Hey there, all you space fans out there. Yeah. It's time for another deep dive with us. And today... We're going to be talking about the race back to the moon. Ooh. It's getting pretty interesting, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it's hotting up for sure. We've got NASA and their Artemis program. Right. Uh, you know, they've hit a bit of a snag with Artemis II, another delay. And then you've got SpaceX just rocketing ahead with Starship. It's crazy how different their approaches seem to be. Mm. So by the end of this deep dive, you'll not only understand why Artemis II is delayed again, but also what it tells us about the different ways we're now approaching space exploration. Mm. Isn't that right? Absolutely. It really is a fascinating time to be following all this. We're seeing this real clash of styles in spaceflight, almost like a generational shift. Yeah, totally. So let's get right into it with this Artemis II situation. Mm -hmm. This mission was originally supposed to send astronauts around the moon in September 2025. Right. But now it's been pushed back to April 2026, mm -hmm. which means a moon landing won't happen until at least 2027. What's going on? Why the delay? Well, it basically comes down to one crucial piece of tech, the heat shield on the Orion capsule. Mm -hmm. 
during Artemis, I, you know, that uncrewed test flight, right. the heat shield got more damage than they expected. Really? Yeah, there was a lot of charring, erosion, even some cracks. And, of course, the heat shield is what keeps the astronauts from burning up on reentry. Right, of course. So NASA's being super cautious about it. Understandably, 1,400 degrees Celsius is no joke. Oh, definitely not. So this really underlines how hard atmospheric reentry is and why getting that heat shield right is absolutely critical. It makes you wonder how SpaceX is doing it. They seem to be reusing Starship without many problems with the heat shield. Yeah, they do, don't they? It's pretty impressive. SpaceX has really been pushing the boundaries with their reusable Starship. And a big part of that is their heat shield tech. Those ceramic tiles they use are incredible. They can withstand those crazy re-entry temperatures without falling apart. So like some kind of super tough heat-resistant armor for the it, spacecraft? Ex it's kind of mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. To think we can reuse a spacecraft like that, it changes everything. And I think I read somewhere that this is the first time ever that a heat shield designed for orbital reentry has been successfully reused. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's a huge achievement. So it's not just about saving money then, is it? What other impl implications does this reusability have? Well, you're right. It's about a whole new way of thinking about space travel. Up until now, rockets and capsules have been single use, Yeah. which makes space exploration ridiculously expensive. It really limits what we can do. It's like throwing away your car after every trip to the grocery store. <laughs> oh. Yeah, exactly. But with reusability, the cost per mission plummets. It opens up so many possibilities. Suddenly, space becomes more affordable for research, for 